All right, today's episode is sponsored by AirTurn.com. Since 2008, AirTurn has been manufacturing wireless products such as Bluetooth pedals and multifunction remotes, supporting hundreds of thousands of customers in over 40 countries. They have a wide range of products to choose from, including the AirTurn Go Stand, one of the best portable mic stands on the market that I use on this show on a regular basis. Head over to AirTurn.com and use the code RODI to save 20% off your entire order that's roadie to save 20 percent off your entire order what's happening roadies this is chris adamson this is dave rat what's happening roadies this is norman harris and you're listening to roadie free radio what's up roadies my name is larry milburn and this is roadie free radio your vip pass to meet and greet the stars behind the scenes of the music and film business all right, all right, here we go. What's happening, roadies? Welcome to episode number 88. This is your host, Larry Milburn. This is Roadie Free Radio. I am coming at you from a barn in Northwest Connecticut. What is going on? How the hell are you? Did you survive the Oscars and the bomb cyclone if you live on the East Coast? Wow, what a weekend, huh? My goodness. Oh, my goodness, as my son says. Yeah, crazy stuff happening, right? Uh, if you live in the Northeast, we had a bomb cyclone that wiped out my uh, my ability to go see Jim Weeder, G.E. Smith, and John Harrington at Daryl's house up in Pauling doing the Masters of the Telecaster. That was a bummer. Was looking forward to that. Looking forward to having a nice night out, but that didn't happen. Dropped some snow. Got very cold. Cut out power to a bunch of families in uh, in our area here in northwest Connecticut. That wasn't fun. We lost power for a couple of hours. Nothing crazy. And, um, yeah, then we had we had the Oscars. What would you guys think? Huh? Did, did your folks win? Did your movie win that you were hoping to win? Crazy stuff. Listen, we got some things to get to this episode, so let's jump in. First of all, if this is your first episode checking us out, we here want to thank you for joining the community. We want to thank you for stopping by to have a listen. I know that there's a lot of stuff out there you could be listening to right now, and it means a lot that you are taking the time to check out the show. This is a show where I take you behind the scenes of the music industry. We talk to front of house engineers, lighting designers, uh, engineers, producers, guitar techs, bass techs, drum techs, you name it. We'll talk to them. If they're out there working in the biz, I'll talk to them. We'll get some good stories going. And uh, you can also check out our YouTube channel where I've been filming some of our milestone episodes. And uh, we've got some cool people up there. And we got a great one coming up in a couple of weeks with Peter Shapiro, concert promoter, filmmaker, owner of the Capitol Theater, owner of the Brooklyn Bowl, the man responsible for bringing the members of the Grateful Dead back together for the Fair the Well Tour. So you're not going to want to miss that when we did that at the Relics Magazine headquarters where his office is in New York City. So stay tuned for that. Um, all right, listen, a couple things I want to tell you. Last week I mentioned that I had an announcement to make. I'm going to be making that shortly. A couple things. Um, for you guitar players out there, if you do not know who Tony Pola Castro is. He's got an awesome YouTube channel. He's a guitar instructor, <clears throat> guitar geek like the rest of us. He's got a channel on YouTube called AcousticLife.tv. AcousticLife.tv. Head over and check it out. Very well done. Some great tips and tricks and reviews. And he goes real deep, man. He's a laid back guy and um, he's doing a good thing. I've been watching the last few weeks. A lot of cool stuff there. This week, he talked about a band that he saw that blew him away. I went and checked them out online, and they blew me away, and I wanted to share it with you guys because they look to be new and up-and-coming. Mapache, M-A-P-A-C-H-E, Mapache. They are a duo, I believe, out of California. Um, they play acoustic guitar. They sing incredible harmonies. Check them out, Mapache. The other thing I wanted to tell you about WPKN radio station in Bridgeport, community radio station. I drop my son off in the mornings at school sometimes, usually on a Tuesday morning for whatever reason it happens. And I get back in the car and I found this station, WPKN, 
with a DJ named I Messiah who plays some incredible reggae, dub, uh, ska, all kinds of great stuff. Anyway, I called the station to find out more about this gentleman and um, turns out they had a record store mashup, record mashup day in Bridgeport Saturday that I missed. Also, was all set to take my son to it, his first sort of you know, record store outing situation at two and a half years old. And I thought it'd be fun to go down and do with DJs and food and music and all kinds of cool stuff and colorful people and everything. And the bomb cyclone put a big, a big bomb on that one. So we didn't make it down there, but I want to give a shout out to WPKN and Bridgeport and I'm Messiah. Thank you guys. Thank you for spinning such great music. I can't believe that nobody gets paid down there. I talked to the station manager. No one's getting paid. They just show up. They spin. They've been doing it for years, and um, they do a hell of a job. So that's my little shout-out to a local radio station here in Connecticut. And uh, stay tuned next week, by the way. Kevin Doogie Dugan, bass tech for Mr. Michael Anthony of Van Halen fame is going to be on the show. Kevin Doogie Dugan, if you know him, very sweet guy. He's a lifer, roadie for life. That's RFL, you know what I'm saying? The man has been with Michael Anthony for 37 and a half years. Whoa, that's a long time to be someone's tech. But he's been with a lot of bands. He's seen a lot of stuff. Let me tell you this. It was a very, very colorful, colorful interview. You can only imagine because we're talking about the 80s and Van Halen. Um, Okay, here's the deal. Today's guest is Mr. Norman Harris of Norman's Rare Guitars out in Los Angeles. Um, If you are anybody who plays the guitar, I hope that you know who Norman Harris is. I hope that you know his store. If you are heading west and you've never been to his store, wow, do yourself a favor. Head over there and check it out because it's like the mecca of incredible vintage guitars. All right, you got to go see it. Uh, everybody shops at his store. He's had he had a long time relationship with Tom Petty. He does a lot of great philanth- philanthropy <laughs> philanthropy work um, with the Midnight Mission in L.A. George Harrison comes up in our stories. Robert Robertson comes up in our stories. Bob Dylan comes up in our story. So you're not going to want to miss this episode. At the beginning of the episode, actually, well, I got to apologize for something real quick. I'm coughing a lot in the episode as it's going. And when I'm listening back, I was like, oh, man, I hope this isn't the problem. So when the episode was done, it was my last episode that I did in L.A. when I was out there for the NAMM show. I flew home. Two days later, ended up in urgent care. Turns out I had bronchitis, which is why I was coughing. So <clears throat> I'm sorry if it's distracting. Uh, it was it was uh, it was a problem, man. It was definitely a problem. And I should not have flown, but I did it. Uh, Because I didn't know I had bronchitis, so what are you going to do? But um, anyway, so that's the first thing. Second thing, the beginning of the episode, we're talking about, uh, Norma's telling me about a new channel that he is launching. He's already got a very highly successful YouTube channel that he's grown. And now he's partnered up with Richie Sambora, John Five, Joe Bonamassa, and they are launching a thing called the All Guitar Network that he describes as basically the golf channel for guitar geeks. Okay, it's it's 24-7 guitar stuff, lessons, tips, tricks, movies, the whole thing. A lot of stuff from Bonamassa on there, a lot of stuff from John Five and some great studio musicians that are going to be playing. Sounds awesome. It's an app. You can download it. It's a website. It's not officially launched yet, but it's just about there. I think in the next couple of weeks from this episode airing, it's going to be coming out. So, okay, he tells me about that. We do the interview. It's great. I split. I fly home. Bronchitis. Bingo, bango. A few days later, <clears throat> I get a call from um, Norman's business partner. Larry, I understand that you had a great interview with Norman. He told me all about it. I went to your website. I checked out Roadie Free Radio. Love what you're doing. How would you feel about partnering with us, with us on the All Guitar Network and having your own little spot on the All Guitar Network to do Roadie Free Radio from, to do some video content, you know, with what you do and what we do and uh, partner up? I said, my man, that sounds fantastic because not only am I going to be in great company with Bonamassa and John Five and these folks, but 
I've had some ideas for some specific kind of content that I've wanted to do, some videos that I've wanted to do on the YouTube channel possibly, but I wasn't quite sure how it was going to play and how it was going to work. And now this will afford me the opportunity to make those videos and bring some special, unique, original content just to this channel and just to that audience. And I hope you guys will head over and check it out. So here's what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to start uploading some videos that you may have already seen on the YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, um, just to start populating some stuff and to let people know that have already been watching All Guitar Network, the kind of stuff that we do here at Roadie Free Radio. And then slowly, I'm going to start ramping up this special little series that I've worked out just for the All Guitar Network. All right? So that's the big news. Roadie Free Radio is now going to be partnering with the All Guitar Network to be bringing some awesome, cool, original, unique content to that channel and to you guys. I hope you will tune in. I hope you'll check it out. And I hope you dig this episode, man. Norman Harris, very, very sweet guy. We had a great time. And uh, again, if you have not been to his store, you need to go check it out. Listen, today's episode is also sponsored by GigGear.com, makers of the award-winning gig gloves and the newly released two-hand touch. Gig gloves are the best way to protect your most valuable asset on any gig job or show, your hands. When you're wearing gig gloves, there's practically no task that you can't do with your gloves on, keeping you safer and more efficient. And for all of you front of house or monitor engineers out there, the two-hand touch is an efficient and ergonomic solution that eliminates all the problems of having to hold an iPad or tablet by putting it right where production pros need it to be, directly in front of them. And listen, right now we have a special offer running with those guys over at Gig Gear. If you use the code ROADY, when you check out, you'll get yourself 15% off the entire order, even pre-orders of the two-hand touch. So head over to their website, that's gig-gear.com. Use that code ROADY, get yourself 15% off your entire order. All right, so here we go. You guys kick back, relax, enjoy. I hope you have a good week. Until next week, my friends, here he is, the man himself, Mr. Norman Harris. Hit it, hit it. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. Call yourself a roadie. All right, sir. Um, so yeah, you were just telling me you were at Nam very quickly. Yep. I think the first day, Thursday or Friday. Thursday. Thursday. I had a panel going on as well, and right. um, I wanted to come to your panel discussion, which I think was at four. I missed it because you were talking about your social media, you're talking about your YouTube channel and whatnot, and how you've grown it. Right. I kind of tried to get out of that, but uh, somehow or other I got roped in. To doing the we, panel? Yeah. Well, you know, what happened was is um, they wrote an article about us in this magazine, Music Inc. Yeah. And that's associated with NAM. Yeah. And they were talking about our social media because we just have gotten so much attention from that. It's you know, awesome. Which is kind of amazing. And, uh, you know, I was one of the last ones to get on board with this stuff because I'm kind of old school. Yeah. Uh, not bragging, but I've never yeah. texted in my life. So Still to this I, day, I, I had, never yes, texted? Yes. And I had some friends of mine actually in the audience who were going to razz me a bit and go, hey, Norm, what's a text? You yeah. know, or something, you know, but they were kind of cool and they, they, let, let, they let you they, alone. They spared my life. Yeah. How did it go, though? Well, it went good. You know, I mean, they basically were just asking us how, you know, we've attracted so much attention. We've been very lucky being in L.A. because we never know who might come in. We get a lot of very big stars. Sure. We've got, like, two videos that we showed at the thing we have this, Who Shops at Norm's Part 1 okay. and Who Shops at Norm's Part 2. And we still, we didn't even touch on how many people come in. Yeah. Big groups and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, that's been a tremendous advantage. And then, you know, um, the guys that work for me, my kids kind of encouraged me. Jen, who does mm -hmm. our videos, Mark, yeah. Nick, you know, all the people, Michael yeah. Lemo, you know, the people that work for me, my repair guys, you know, they kind of encouraged me. So yeah. we started doing it and it just kind of caught fire. And, uh, you know, a lot of it has to do with the repetition of just, you know, Keep putting, putting up stuff there. all the time sure. and putting up stuff that's kind of interesting. Thing. Yeah, I mean, you can't make it an advertisement; otherwise, right. nobody's gonna right. listen or watch. You know, right. I mean, exactly. you've got, it's got to be—you got to come up with interesting.
interesting content. Yeah. You know, we're also starting a thing called the All Guitar Network, which okay. is just about to launch. And that oh, is Oh, you were telling me so about cool. that a little bit yeah. on the phone. Yeah, tell me, what it's is that? It's really cool. Well, uh, the technical end of it, I'm not the guy, yeah. but um, it's going to be um, on your phone. It's going to be an app uh-huh. where you can go to Apple TV, Roku, Hulu, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you can get this, and it's everything. It's going to be movies. Uh huh. Uh, all guitar related television, live performance. Um, it's going to be gear reviews. It's going to wow. be talking about vintage stuff. It's wow. going to be lessons. It's going to be repairs and learning how to do repairs. It's, you know, we've got, you know, a lot of really great people. Joe Bonamassa is one of the owners. Richie Sambora is one of the owners. Uh-huh. Um, we have um, John Five is going to do a show. My friend Deke Dickerson is going to do a show. Oh, awesome. Uh, this other friend of mine, Rick Vito, is going to do sure. a show. Um, talking about Rick Vito from that. Rick yeah. Vito, he was in the documentary I did. Right. Well, Rick yeah. and I played in a band together for a couple of years Did back you? in the 70s here in LA. Yeah. yeah. So he's a sweet um, guy. He's great. You yeah. know, and he's one of the best slides. Jack players Pearson in the was world. in that too. You know, Jack is unbelievable. Jack's I, a I just met Jack for the first time. I was on the Joe Bonamassa Blues Cruise yeah. last year. Yeah. And I just went to see J-Mo, and it was kind of late at night, uh, and I was kind of just staggering back to my room going, boy, I really want to lay down. Yeah. And I passed this one little nightclub on the on the boat, uh-huh. and all of a sudden I heard this guy, and I went, holy crap, this guy's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And I'd never heard of him before. Right. And I was just astounded how good he was. He had yeah. a great Hammond B3 player with him, right. and that was my main instrument was B3. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know that. that was, you know, what I actually played when yeah. I was playing with Rick and all that. So, um, you know, I just... I wanted to go to sleep, but I stayed for the entire set. It was great. Yeah. And then one of my buddies kind of elbows me and goes, you see that guitar he's playing? And I was kind of standing back a little ways. He goes, you know what that is? I go, yeah, it's a Stratocaster. He goes, no, it's a Squire Strat. And he made the thing sound great. I don't know if he put yeah. some great pickups in it or what, right, right. but he sure made the thing sound great. So Jack I, was, and I introduced myself and we met and yeah. um, he was a very nice guy. But Sweetheart of a guy, talent. right? Yeah. yeah. He played, so he was in this documentary with Arlen Roth, played mm-hmm. in this album, uh, The mm-hmm. Slides summit arlen roth slide guitar summit and i went down to nashville to get a bunch of interviews for the documentary that i was doing the behind the scenes of that record and i met rick vito and uh jack pearson and a bunch of these folks and they were so nice and jack and then i got then i flew back down once the movie and the album came out yeah and they did a show at the city winery down there cool and watching him play live was such a lesson in not doing anything yeah. You know what I mean? Like well, the good guys make it look easy. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Well, you know, like, it's funny. like Larry Campbell. You seen that guy play, yeah, right? I mean, it's like one, his yeah. shoulders don't move at all. Yeah. It's just all in his fingers and his wrists. Yeah. Unreal, man. Well, when we when I was playing with Rick, um, we had a pretty good band in LA in the seventies uh-huh. and uh Bonnie Raitt actually stole him out of our band. Then he went from Bonnie Raitt to Jackson Brown, yeah. he did that uh Lawyers in Love right. and then he went with Fleetwood Mac and yep. Stevie Nicks and then he also played with um Bob Seger. Uh, right. Bob Seger. He played all the slide on like a rock, you yeah. know, which was pretty famous from it's... especially from that commercial. Exactly. He got a lot of play out of that. Yeah, totally. Sweet guys though, and great yeah. players and just uh Again, an exercise in efficiency and right. non-flash. Well, you know, uh, both Rick, uh, Rick and Jack are like ultimate taste players, too. Yeah. I mean, it's not about playing a lot of notes, although they can blaze like anybody else. It's about right. playing the right notes and yeah. doing the proper thing for the tune. Yeah, exactly. And both of them sing great, too. Yes, yes, they do. Jack's got a great talk about learning in a resource site like you. Uh-huh. His website is great. He offers uh, lessons and one on videos on there as well that he does. Right. Well, you know, on our the All Guitar Network, Tim <laughs> Pierce is also going to have a show, you know, and Tim is, he's got this thing, Tim and Pete, yep. uh, Pete Thorne and Tim Pierce, and it's fabulous and they're doing great with that. Great. And so he's going to have a show on that. So it's going to be everything. If you're a guitar player, it's like the Golf Channel to wow. a, a golfer. This right. is going to be to like guitar players. So is it basically an app that then opens out to all right. these Right, and things? then you kind of choose the genre of what you want, and yeah. you know whether it's films, movies, TV, you know reviews, interviews, a wow. lot of behind the scenes stuff. Like Joe Bonamassa is going to do some of the stuff from his guitar safari, where he goes to whatever town and goes right. out looking for guitars. Yeah. So there'll be like kind of a lot of stuff that's like fly on the wall, like you know you get to see how they really are. Yeah. Off stage, right? Not just on stage, right? I know. I one of my favorite. 
favorite videos is the one that Reverb did with him at his house. Yeah, Nerdville. Oh yeah. my God, that's incredible. you know it's funny about a week ago, Joe came out and he had this. Uh, I think it was a '64 Sport Fury mm. that he got. You know, he's got the Nerdville truck, yeah. which is oh, I yeah. think it's a '32 Ford. Yeah. But he had this '64 Sport Fury, beautiful car. Yeah, came up, parked it in front of the store, and then he couldn't start it to, <laughs> to tow it. You know, and so it's wow. uh, you know that's kind of his thing. He loves all kinds of cool vintage stuff. Yeah, and he's a great guy. I've known actually Joe since he was 12. Yeah. And, well, I uh, saw the video you guys did together. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's one of the great guys and maybe the best blues player alive. Yeah, he's pretty phenomenal. I mean, I haven't just been a customer here. You know, I've, I've all, I also geek out and watch the show. And what's nice about it too, your YouTube channel is that, you know, one day it's the it's sort of the back in the vault, right? The guitar of the day, right. which is awesome. And then, well, that we do every day. That's that that's come, kind does of that come out every that's day? more Instagram, and that's like every day. Right. And there's about two hundred and fifty thousand subscribers plus on that. Wow. And uh, and then we've got about I don't know twelve or thirteen hundred videos with sixty, seventy, eighty million views. I don't I don't know what it's the insane. total is now. Yeah. But I got to imagine as a quote unquote small business owner in a somewhat niche market, right. battling against the guitar centers and Sam Ashes and all that kind of stuff. You, you, it probably was a big lesson for you in adapting. Right? It was. I mean, you know, we and very, you've built an awesome online community. Right. Well, we were very fortunate because the store, I've never had a bad year in the yeah. uh, 40 years that we've been open, even before I became awake to social media and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Everybody was telling me, what are you doing? You got to get with it. And I was going, I like to see people face to face and talk to them because sure. when somebody says in print, yeah, right. I don't know whether they're going, yeah, right, or yeah, right. You know, so you don't know really what that means. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of, you know, old school, kind of the old school part of me. But then I realized I had to get with it. And it really, when we saw it, really starting to take off. Yeah. Then we have, you know, we have a lot of stuff that's like, uh, and this is going to be also part of the All Guitar Network, where we get young, undiscovered talent. Right. We, we just had a kid come in for NAM. This was a complete blow mind. Kid's seven years old, and he comes in with his dad and his brother. And he said, and the dad says, um, can he play a jazz bass? And I'm looking at the kid. I mean, he's seven years old. He looks like he's five. I mean, he's, he's a really small kid. I'm going to jazz bass. Can he even reach the bottom of the neck? Of yeah, that? right. You know, I mean, it was like it was bigger than he was. <laughs> right. And so um, so I said, he, the father said, I'll be responsible. Don't worry. I said, oh, fine. You know, so I hand him a jazz bass. And his brother says, yeah, he's a big fan of Jocko. I went, well, great. That's a good guy to yeah, kind of right. follow. You're on you the know. right path. Sure. So, um, and then he starts playing some Jocko stuff, you know, and it was like ridiculously good for a seven-year-old kid. Wow. I mean, I couldn't play it, and I've played for a while. You know, I mean, this kid was really a special talent. Wow. Within a day, we had 100,000 hits on our Instagram. Really? You know, so, wow. Um, the, the kid, and he was, uh, he was from Slovakia, which was, you know, uh, you know, even like, more of a stretch. Uh, even more, yeah, because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, where would a kid like that even find, although now it's the internet. You sure. can find anything you want. So, but, I mean, of all things, I was expecting him to say, I like some young group, you know, or yeah. some, you know, basic thing right and he picks Jocko and then he's playing like all the harmonics and all this kind of stuff and I'm kind of going wow you know this kid's like a freak and that, yeah right and that is the cool thing about the channel is that you don't just have the Frank Stallones or the Joe Bonamassas yeah. and whatnot you definitely I mean I watched the one with a young surfer gentleman who came uh -huh. through right yep. then you had is it Taz yeah he mm -hmm. just played, he played at the Telefunken after party at NAMM uh -huh. uh, and joined a band that I was at. And that was incredible. I mean, it was one thing to watch him on your channel, yeah. doing well, his thing, see, but when you see it live, you're like, oh my God. Well, we kind of, you know, we throw these guys in on a video. We don't do retakes. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, so it's <laughs> whatever no happens, guts. happens. Yeah. So it's organic and it is yeah. what it is. And, um, but, you know, speaking of Frank Stallone, uh, you know, that's another story altogether. Yeah. And we, yeah. you know, some of our videos that we do, I mean, you know, some of them are informative. Some of them are, you know, talking about vintage guitars. Some sure. is introducing new talent or bringing some famous guitar players that happen to stop in. Yeah. And a lot of them are really good friends of mine. So when I ask them to do videos, and I've even had like Tom Petty, who was an old friend of mine Absolutely. for 40 years. I played in a band with his bass player, oh, cool. Ron Blair, prior yeah. to him being in the Heartbreakers. Wow. And so that was 40 years ago. And I've known Tom since then, and, yeah. you know, and all that. So yeah. that was kind of a heartbreak. But Absolutely. getting back to Frank Stallone, 
uh, you know, Frank is a very acquired taste. He's funnier than hell. Yeah. And he's very outspoken. And he says stuff that I have to go, uh, in no way does this represent the management of Norm's Rare Guitars, anything he says, you know. yeah. Then he comes in one day, uh, well, first of all, he's got like his own website, and on that right. website, you know, one day he's got like a Julius Caesar haircut, the next day he looks like Elvis <laughs> with Elvis glasses, the next yeah. day he's wearing a sombrero, you know, the guy's like the village people all right, wrapped right. up into one. <laughs> right. Then he comes in, into the store, and my friend Larry Lee, who used to play with Badfinger and he used uh -huh. to produce groups for Casablanca, Larry's got this dog that is a German Shepherd and Wolf mix. The dog is gigantic and uh -huh. he's a puppy. So uh, Frank was in and he was, you know, playing some guitar and the dog climbed up on the couch with Frank and starts kissing Frank and, you know, whatever. At the end of the interview, Frank gets down on his hands and knees to play with the dog and the dog mounts him in the video. <laughs> So we, we titled the video, uh, Frank Salone Has Sex in the Front Room of Norm's Rare Guitars. Nice. And so, I'm sure he got a bajillion hits. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah, people have a lot to say about him. And, you know, yeah. and he goes with it. And, you know, and he takes a lot of heat. And, you know, so uh, we have a lot of fun with him. Yeah. But uh, Frank is definitely uh, a unique yeah. unique specimen. I, I crossed paths with that guy. We'll go on a little side tangent, Frank Stallone tangent. I crossed paths with him years ago around the 2000s. Well, late '90s, early 2000s. A, a buddy of mine was a radio per Al Bandiero. I don't know if you know uh -huh. that guy. He's friends with him, and so I met Frank right. through that. And yeah, interesting guy. He's actually a tremendous talent. He's a great yeah. singer. Yeah, he's a very good guitar player. He's yeah. written a lot of tunes for movies and right. stuff like that. He's acted in right. uh, uh, Barfly. He was great with Mickey Rourke. Yeah, I mean, he's been in a lot of movies and stuff like that. Yeah, but his attention span is about that of <laughs> ten seconds. So he comes in and goes. Uh, you got any strats? I like 335s. I, right. That's a D'Angelico. You know, and it's yeah. like, Frank, <laughs> just calm down. You know, what do you want right. to see? You know, and it's like, you know, that's just Frank. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun with him. And Good. Uh, he's he's like one of our brothers. I've known Frank for many years. Yeah. And I've gone to boxing with Frank. And I went to his house when um, it was Mike. Uh, it was... Uh, um, it was uh, Mike Tyson and... Um, when he bit Evander oh, Hollyfield's yeah. uh, ear, you yeah. know, I was at Frank's house watching that fight. Oh my god! You know, so um, you know he's really into boxing and yeah. he's into you know he's kind of a Trump supporter and you know right. won't get political. An, in but, an know, interesting he's, yeah, he's bag very interesting. of tricks. Yeah. So All let's go back. One. You have been doing this for forty. Years. Have you had this store for forty years? I well, we're originally down the street from here, about a mile and a half from here, okay. on Tampa and Van Owen. Okay. Now we were, it was it was originally a less than a five hundred square foot store. Oh. You know, when I first opened, I didn't know if vintage guitars, you know, would be around in five right. years. But know, weren't you doing was, it at some point out of your house, out of your oh, apartment? Oh yeah. I mean, I I was doing it in Miami. I was playing right. with the band. I had a guy named Bobby Caldwell who was a Excellent songwriter and keyboard mm -hmm. and guitarist had a big hit with "What You Won't Do for Love," but he's had a lot of a, a lot of hits for a lot of people. Okay. And um, so I was kind of buying and selling some stuff in Miami on the side. Yeah. And I was a musician, was Plan A. Right. Then we came out here with our band, and uh, you know I realized that musical instruments, guitars are tangible. I could look at somebody hand him a guitar and go, this is great. Mm. Where my music, I knew kind of what sucked about it. And, right. I, you know, I had a hard time keeping a straight face telling people it was good. Yeah. So. Are uh, you a Florida guy originally? Well, I'm originally <clears throat> born in Philly. Okay. So was Frank Sloan and so was Rick Vito, by the way. Right. But, right. Uh, but, um, but I grew up in Miami. Okay. And we came out in mm -hmm. 1970. And as I was a kind band. Of, as a band. And I was yeah. kind of buying and selling on the side already from Miami. And this was you know, being in LA it kind of was a Especially huge in nineteen seventy, right? Yeah. yeah. So and by word of mouth, I uh like George Harrison was one of my very first big name customers. Wow. And then Robbie Robertson, I had an ad in the um uh, LA Times for some guitars for sale and Robbie called me and he just identified himself as Robbie. He came out, uh, I had a little apartment in Sherman Oaks, yeah. but it was just covered with guitars everywhere. Yeah. And uh, Robbie was kind of amazed because nobody had vintage guitars at all in L.A. at that right, time. Right, right. And uh, so 
he he bought a few guitars for me, and then he said, "Would you mind if I brought any friends?" I said, "No, nah, I don't. I don't really care." And then he identified himself as Robbie Robertson from the band, right. who I was a big fan, but I didn't know what Robbie looked like, so right. I didn't recognize him. And the next week, he called and said, "Would you mind if I bring a friend over?" I said, "Nah, come on over." You know, he comes in, he brings Bob Dylan. Then the next week, he brings Joni Mitchell and Robin Ford, and wow. you know, on and on. So he was really very instrumental in getting me started, and it became kind of a word of mouth thing. And LA that that's I had great the cool vintage guitars well that's how you know I think I mentioned you that Jim Weeder told me his whole right. story of getting his 52 telly yes. that he uh, still plays today I know still Jim does. comes in and, and he, uh, he tortures time, right? me I sold him the telly it's a black card telly from early 50s I was beautiful for oh. 350 bucks and Jim every time he comes in he goes yeah you remember this I go yeah thanks Jim thanks for reminding me did what did I, you pay for that wasn't it like 450 he tells us something it was like 450 or something no, he was, was like I remember it better than he does does. Well, Whatever right. it was, it was way too cheap. It's about a yeah. thirty, forty thousand dollar guitar now. It's crazy, so, uh, and he likes to rub it in my face. But you know that's cool. You but know? he talks. He told me originally when I met him about finding you in your apartment and uh-huh. he was coming out I think from Nashville or something and he'd always wanted right. a 52 toe it was just his thing Yep. and he found you and he's like yeah man I went to Norm's and I got together and he told me when I come out to meet you a couple of years ago he to remind like, me yeah. again thank you Jim I appreciate <laughs> you it you probably buddy. have a lot of those stories yeah, I would no, imagine there's a lot of them I mean yeah, I have a pretty good many. investment record you know like when <laughs> when I met George Harrison the story and you know I have two books out you know the first yeah. book Tom Petty did the forward the second one Joe Bonamassa and Richie Sambor did the forwards to the that but in the second book there's a story about the George Harrison thing Mm. and George had one of his guitars stolen it was a red Les Paul that Clapton gave him Uh, he called it Lucy because it was red like Mm -hmm. Lucille Ball and um, so they found the guy who had the guitar the guy said I'd be happy to give you back your guitar George but I did buy in good faith from this other store a 50s Les Paul standard, so I would like one in exchange for this guitar, and I'll be fine with that. So, Wait, so he stole George's guitar? No, no, he didn't oh, steal it. Some okay. guy stole it, sold it to a store in okay, Hollywood. Got it. I think they did like a police report, everything, but okay. it turned out, you know, that the guitar ended up getting sold to this guy, and the guy lived half the year in Mexico, half the year in the United States. Right. So he went, he was in Mexico. Somehow or other, we got his number, we got in touch with him. He was cool with it. He said, you know, I want to give George back. You know, yeah. I don't want to... You know, right, George and that would be bad karma having yeah. George Harrison's guitar. But he said, "Look, I bought a '50s standard. I would like one in exchange for it." Okay. So George found uh, through a couple other people I know this store called University Music in West LA, and this friend of mine, Dale Rossman, owned the store. And uh, he said to, D- to Dale, "Do you have any late '50s Les Pauls?" And um, Dale said, "I don't, but I have a buddy of mine. And I had three of them at the time." So he called me, and I was uh, I was living in this apartment in Sherman Oaks, and uh, he didn't want to tell me who it was. He said, "Come on down here. I got a special customer." I and need what, to what meet year him. are we in here? This was what 1971 or 72 wow. it was at the time of you know george having that living in a material world sure he had that tune give me love which was just rising up the charts at this yeah. time you know and uh you know so uh, eventually he came to tell me that it was george and I, and I go over to the music store and my friend dale's sitting there by himself and i go you know did you make me drive all the way down here for nothing you know yeah. and we and he said no George is having a piece of pizza right next door. And uh, all of a sudden, George walks in with Mal Evans, who was a Beatles road sure. manager. And uh, I was kind of dumbfounded because, you know, yeah. when you're meeting a, a yeah. big star, doing business with a big star, the biggest, you know, the Beatles were beyond anything. I mean, right. Plus, know, that was like just post ba- breakup ish. Yeah. So it wow. was crazy. I kept looking at him thinking it was like That's a double him. or something like yeah. that. That it yeah, could right. possibly be. So, um, so anyhow, he ended up coming to my apartment, buying one Les Paul to trade to get his guitar back, and one of the other ones um, could, that he just fell in love with, this 1960 that he bought. And then he bought a 56 Strat for me, and he made me throw in a Tweed Princeton amp. I mean, I, I mean, and I gave him great deals. I think the Sunburst Les Paul was 1500 bucks. Yeah. Now it's about 250000 Wow. Um, the... 56 Strat was 1500 bucks, and he made me throw in this beautiful tweed Princeton amp. You know, and I, you know, it was George. I just wanted him to have the stuff, sure. so I didn't care. But, I mean, it was it was really strange. But that kind of led one thing to the next, and a lot of people come in my way. Wow. You had, there's a video up um, with Sebastian. 
Right. Mm-hmm. And um, that's Robbie's son. Guys. Mm-hmm. Right, Robbie's son. And they're they're you guys are looking at the and talking about the guitar. It was a Telecaster. The Telecaster, bombs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was that originally purpose here? Uh, purchase here? Uh, that you or guitar, no? not for me, <laughs> but uh, but I knew about the guitar. Yeah. You okay. know, so. Um, Wow. Uh, so they came in and, you know, I don't know That's a good whether video. they're going to broker that guitar or not. I'm not, I'm right. not sure on that. What's know? one of your favorite sort of happenstance community type things that have come out of the store? Well, um, you know, probably, you know, something that I didn't realize that I was going to be exposed to was the movie business being mm. in Los Angeles. Right. So um, the first movie that I ever got involved with was David Carradine was a customer of mine. He loved a lot of acoustic guitars and stuff. And he came in and he said they were doing a movie called Bound for Glory, which was a Woody Guthrie story. Yeah. And he said, you know, I would like the instruments to be correct. And I believe if there was a Guinness Book of Records, is probably the first movie ever to try to get the instruments correct yeah and it was correct 99 percent of the time except at the very end he pulled out a mossman guitar i have no idea why he did that you know and david was a serious character yeah so there was no explanation why i saw it in the movie and i was going we went and got all these instruments correct for you and then you pull out this mossman but you know david you know it you know you expect the unexpected yeah so all right so let's go back even further let's go back to you know philly growing up what your folks do well my dad actually was in the sewing machine business okay he was a russian immigrant yeah and he came to the states broke no family didn't speak english uh he was an ellis island uh, you know yep. kind of a real american story yep after World War II, he started fixing sewing machines and stuff like that. And after World War II, he went to Japan and he got the rights for brother sewing machines for the United States sure. you know, during the Marshall Plan and yeah. all that. And so he uh, opened a factory in Philly. And um, then eventually I lived there for the first three years or so of my life. Uh-huh. Then we moved to New Orleans where he opened a factory. Wow. And then I lived there for a few years, and then I moved to Miami where I grew up. Yep. And he opened a factory there, and he retired in 1958. Wow. So um, when he retired, you know, we were in Miami. I went to school there, and he was very supportive. I was playing piano, and I sang a bit and all that, you know. So, I mean, he got me, like, you know, three lessons a, a week, you know. I mean, he, yeah. you know, he saw that I loved it, and he was really supportive of it, you know. So, But, you know, he kind of went from absolutely nothing and he did pretty well you know become kind of a um yeah i mean he was homeless when he came to when he got uh, here right the states wow so i'm involved actually with this charity called the midnight mission out here and it's a homeless charity and right I brought all these people got them involved with it i mean you know richie sambora yeah los lobos jackson brown don Felder, yeah. um freebo um uh ario speedwagon john mayall all uh, richie sambora robin ford joe bonamassa several times yeah. you know in fact joe just got an award last year right for helping these guys out but i always felt like you know because my dad was homeless i mean you know it's like you know you never know who you might be helping somebody might sure uh you know turn out to be you know have a lot of potential i just never had the opportunity right so i've been very much involved with that that's also really kind of you know in my old age it's kind of really given me something to sink my teeth into right absolutely so when you were doing music and whatnot your dad was super supportive i mean now we're getting into like the 60s like you said i mean if you moved out here in 70 that means you were playing in a band from at least 68 yeah well i was actually playing in bands you know i was kind of a big kid so even at 13 i was playing with guys that were like 18 wow you know that kind of thing yeah so we were playing around miami a lot yeah and And you're playing keyboards keyboards and i had a few bands in miami and then with this guy bobby caldwell we put together a band we ended up getting signed to mainstream records which uh-huh. was the same label at big brother and the holding company sure on. we came out to california um mo austin yeah. uh, you know all that kind of stuff and yeah little richard's brother actually richard actually heard the band loved the band had us come out hooked us up with mo austin and all that kind of stuff but you know nothing ever really came out of it and yeah. uh, bobby actually went back to miami had big hits and all that you know later on i was continually playing in bands out here but the musical instrument thing became sort of went from plan b to plan a and why the 
Well, at that point, it wasn't vintage, right? I mean, I guess it they was. They didn't call it were, vintage. That right. wasn't the word. It was, it was like used, used guitars. Used yeah. guitars. Right. Why was that part of it, you know, as opposed to going to work for a regular music store? Well, say. you know, what happened in Miami was, you know, I was playing with um, two really good guitar players that both doubled on bass. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them had this old 335. And he pointed out to me, you know, feel the neck on this thing and then listen to the pickups on it, you know. And then, you know, we would go to like a new music store and look at like what was happening in the late 60s. And he said, see how this neck is kind of wide and flat. And yeah. it's got, you know, PAF pickups. They sounded really good. Right. Um, and it kind of pointed out to me what was so cool about the old guitars. And that kind of got me into it. So being, you know, the one thing is I'm not the brightest guy in the world, but I'm not lazy. That's the one right. thing. So I was getting up at five, six in the morning, getting all the newspapers, going to all the pawn shops, the thrift stores, the music stores, whatever. Right. And trying to find old instruments. And I had like a little, um, you know, group of people that like the old instruments and I kind of developed a little clientele. That's amazing. Yeah. A lot of it's v luck and just being in the right place at the right time. And well, I mean, that's the other part of me too. Moving out here in 1970 again, now all of a sudden you're in the like singer songwriter boom of Los Angeles. Right. right. So they're looking for great sounding acoustic instruments. And I mean, you were dealing with both, but sure. You know, to find all those from the sort of folky days, right? And, yeah. and well, I mean, that. I was dealing probably equally in electrics as well as acoustics. Yeah. So I came out here with maybe about 50 or 60 instruments from Miami. Yeah. And uh, then when I started looking, the LA Times was like a tremendous source to find stuff. And this was before the internet. I was going to say, it must have been a yeah. whole other type of adventure. Yeah, it wasn't, I, <clears throat> there wasn't even anything like a penny saver or right. a recycler or any of that right. kind of stuff. I remember and, that. Yeah, none of that stuff even existed. There was n nothing on the internet. And you had to find out the information yourself. So I did a lot of research on right. my own asking a lot of people because it wasn't printed you know the, yeah. the stuff so i'd find some old guys that really knew about there was one repairman who i used to sit and ask questions all day long and you know i've been married for 49 years i've been with my wife for a really long time. you've been with mary you've been married for 49 yeah. years so my wife was with me in the beginning of this <laughs> and you know That's so i would incredible. ask this yeah i know so I'm old school, you know. That I'm, is awesome. I'm too weak to fight, like right. Clarence Carter said, you know. So. Yes, dear. Yes. Just a lot of that's yes, that, dear, right? That's exactly it. <laughs> that's, you know, it's much easier that way. It's much easier. So, but, you know, I used to ask this old guy, his name was John Black. He was a repairman in Miami, and I would sit and just drill him and ask him everything I could about stuff. And my wife would be trying to dr drag me out of there by the arm, and I would just, I, wanted, I got another couple of questions I want to ask. But that's all I found out about a lot of this stuff. Wow. And uh, I've been used as kind of a source for a lot of the books that are out there yeah you know for information uh you know you know this is prior to them being able to get a lot of the old shipping records and right. stuff like right. that so what is it about the whole thing for you is it the hunt is it the information the heritage of an instrument right is it the thrill of the sale sort of a thing what is you know it what? is it the, fixing the them sale, what is it for you the sale part of it to me is the least of it because if i have good stuff people are going to want it right so to me it is the so hunt it sells itself it's also you know i recognize the quality of the old stuff i mean you know yeah. they were making a lot less instruments they were using aged wood right. and you know the alloys and the pickups were different than what they're using today um you know there were people who were working in the factories who were like lifers. Yeah. They were guys that worked for 30, 40 years building guitars. Now, you know, the demand has gotten so high that they have to just kind of throw stuff out. Right. Now it's all CNC machines, so right. everything's sort of cookie cutter. But back then, every old guitar was individual and different, and that's what I kind of loved about it. Yeah. So it was finding the stuff, which I really loved. Yeah. And then and coming up with ways to find the stuff, because, you know, you had to be a little creative. Sure. I had to throw ads in the newspaper. I started calling all these guys <laughs> in the Musicians Union Handbook, and, you know, just any way that I could come up with. My wife one time said, why don't you throw an ad in the paper under horses for sale and ask, you know, put guitars wanted. I said, well, why would you do that? She goes, cowboy play guitar turned out i found a lot of really nice guitars that way but wow. it was sort of you know it was just like an experiment that you just try something as goofy as it sounded sure you know it worked so, so as a small business owner mm -hmm. let's call it yeah you're not afraid to try something new see if it works again like like with you know the internet and social media sure. and all that kind of stuff jump right in right 
you you know you have to be open to things and you know if you're a business and you don't you're not flexible you know a lot of the times you're going to get left behind yeah. so you got to figure out new ways to solve old problems yeah i mean obviously i love the fact you said you've never had a bad year right in 40 years which is awesome right. but i got to imagine there's been times where you're like oh my god well, I this mean, you know, just when the rough you know, recession in 2008, right, you know, we felt music, it, you maybe, know, and stuff right? like that. Yeah, there's been all kinds of stuff, but there's always been a select market for the vintage stuff. It's not for everybody. Not right. everybody recognizes the quality of the instruments and yeah. all that. So um, it's, uh, you know, it's gotten to the point now where a lot of these manufacturers think that every kid should have a guitar or multiple guitars. Right. That's not true. Not every kid plays baseball. Not every kid plays football. Not every kid plays guitar. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I liked it as kind of a select thing where it's like a, an elite club that, you know, certain people were into. Sure. And out of all the people that were into guitars, only a fraction of those were into the vintage stuff and I understood what that was all about. Yeah. What's your favorite part about watching people come in your store? Well, in, in my store, you just never know who might walk through the door. I yeah. Mean, you know, some days it's big stars. Sometimes it's young kids who can really play. Right. Um, some days it's instruments coming through the door that, you know, knock me out. I'm still, I still get excited about the box. Do you? Mm -hmm. Do you go out and, and still look oh, for something? Oh, yeah. I travel yeah. all over. Constantly. And go to trade shows and any way that I can get them. Yeah. Because we have to have the good stuff if we want people to right, come of course. and buy. Right, of course. Of course. And you've built up an awesome team that... that does everything in there with Thank you and for yeah. you and all that kind of stuff. So was it a tough transition, 1970, 71, where you're like, yeah, the music thing. I well, I like I this mean, a little I bit always... more. Or was it more just that realization, like, you know, conversation I have with a lot of people on the show or, you know, well, I, I'm not going to be George Harrison. Right. So... Plus, you were playing a B3. You got to lug that thing around. Right. Well, you know, again, <laughs> right. you know, I came out here with one intention, but I was already doing my plan B, which mm. was the instruments. And then I realized that I was exposed to a huge market out here. Right. And so, you know, with the music business, of course, um, you know, I've written a few tunes that, you know, have been placed in movies mm -hmm. and different things like that. But, um, but it's so hit and miss. Yeah. And if you like eating on a regular basis, if you want to raise a family, you got to be practical and you got to sure. do what you got to do. Yeah. So I realized that, um, you know, plan B was starting to take over. And, uh, you know, I, I, I had hoped up until a certain point that the music thing, you know, this was just kind of buying time until the music thing happened. But right. I realized that I was, had developed something that I can actually be really good at, right. maybe be number one or, you know, one of the yeah. best in the world, where with music, there were so many guys who could play way better than me, you know, yeah. and, you know, so it's it's hard to gauge that. Yeah. And is that what keeps you going? Just never knowing who's going to walk through the door? Never yeah, know that one instrument that's I mean, I really you enjoy, I mean, I'm not digging a ditch over there. I mean, yeah. I, I enjoy what I do. Yeah. And there's always surprises to be had. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of these people are like old friends of mine from so many years now in these right. big groups and all that. And so I have a good relationship with them. And it's just like almost like the barbershop. You never know who's going to come in. Your buddies right. come in and right. have fun. We don't take it too seriously. I mean, you know, as far as the guitars go, we know, you know, all the details on the vintage guitars and all that. You know, I would like to think that we're one of the top experts. Sure. But we don't try to, you know, with our, you know, internet stuff, we don't try to rub that in people's face because, right. you know, if you want to say, well, this year it had nine screws in the pick guard and, right. it, you know, this year there was lacquer and this next year was polyurethane, all that stuff, it's out there. People can find that out. If you start just reciting, you know, statistics to them yeah. is boring. Yeah. So what we try to do is we try to incorporate some of the statistic things yeah. while we keep the show entertaining and fun, you know. Right. So we try to keep people tuning in. <coughs> and well, the I other... think that's how any, you know, program of any kind, you know, yeah. you want people to tune in tomorrow. Right. Well and the other great part is they're all out. They're all out there. These amazing instruments for you to come and play. There's a 1950 this, there's a 1960 that, whatever it is. Well, I mean, the, obviously, the, the real thing, special they're not ones. all out there because there are some that are still st stuck away from family members that have been there. I mean, every once in a while we get calls and I have this and I have that. Right. It's kind of amazing with the internet and everything. Sure, you know, but so. I mean in the store. Oh, yeah. Right, you walk in. Well, it's not like they're, and they're behind not a case. Because we have about well, six or 700 instruments in a warehouse. <laughs> right. And we've got about 150 in the back, and we've got loads of really cool stuff out. So um, we try to, you know, 
put a, a good smattering of the stuff out. But right. Some of the most expensive high end stuff we show by appointment. But I mean, in terms of here it is. Here's a vintage instrument. It's not behind a piece of glass. We want it's people not, to play them. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's yeah. open. Enjoy this thing. Right. You know, why do you love the guitar so much? Well, one thing that I think is really cool about the guitar that's different from a piano or an organ, you can do it with a synthesizer, but it's not the same, is you can bend a note and put a vibrato on it like the human voice. Mm. So it's very expressive. Yeah. Where a piano, you can't bend a note. An organ, you can't bend a note. With synth, you can, but it sounds very... Um, mechanical and yeah. very devised you know where with a guitar you can adjust the vibrato speed and intensity and all that to your fingers it's it's really like a voice yeah and yet you can completely accompany yourself playing guitar you can play a complete tune and sing to it where anybody who could play trumpet and sing to it's going to make a lot of money if that ever happens <laughs> right. but you know i haven't heard it yet yeah right exactly um, you obviously, as we've talked, you got a long list of celebs that come in and, and great players and whatnot, but I can also bet my bottom dollar that you've had a long list of guitar techs and roadies who've come through here oh, that yeah. are supporting those people. Mm -hmm. Um, so well, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, Alan Rogan, who was like, you know, one of the most known, I mean, he did the Stones and ACDC yeah. and, uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash and all that. We had Artie Smith who was in here yesterday is from the East coast has done everybody from Eric Clapton to, yeah. you know, everybody and yeah. on and on. I mean, there's just so many of them. I'd, I'd hate to, uh, you know, neglect any of the ones, but you right. know, there's a it's, lot of them. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And a lot of these guys, you know, because, you know, especially as these groups are very successful, they don't have to tour all the time. Right. So what happens is when they come off the road, these guys have to find their next gig. So right. they may rotate between the Stones and ACDC and Crosby, Sills yep. and Nash and whoever, you know, the Eagles. Yeah. And, you right. know, we have Victor, the Eagles stack is another guy who comes in. Yep. I mean, just on and on. Yep. And these guys are good guys and they're our buddies too. Sure. Um, you know, Joe's got, you know, a couple of his his friends you know that yep. kind of scope out stuff for him right and uh you know yeah, so they're probably touring with an old instrument they bring it back to you and say hey we got to get this done to it or whatever is if they can't do it or something yeah I mean, you know so that. we can do certain repairs that they might not <laughs> be able to do because they can do kind of the quick fix and stuff like that in fact we were there was a show called roadies that we had yeah. supplied some instruments and they were wearing some of our t-shirts right right that. right you know so um but those are the guys you know that are you know, down and dirty with it all, you know. Yeah. So those are the guys that, uh, you know, kind of do a lot of the heavy lifting and then the rock stars come in and right. decide what they Just want. Just get to pluck pluck away. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you get this all the time. So let's say I'm a newbie into this world. What are like three or four things I should consider or think about when I'm thinking about buying a vintage instrument? Well, I mean, when it comes to a vintage instrument, uh, you know, the first thing is is, you know, at one point it got to the point where people who hardly played started buying them because they were such a good investment and they mm -hmm. did very well. I always believe, you know, that you should buy things that you love because that way, if there's no value to anything, you're going to enjoy having it and playing it. You know, I would never say, well, you like less balls, but I think you should buy this, you know, right. instead. You should buy what makes you happy. That's the first thing, because if you like it, more than likely somebody else is going to like it too. Yeah. So that's that's the first thing. There are some things that we call sleepers, which are things that maybe are undervalued in today's market that could potentially go up and yep. that kind of thing. And sometimes you got to look in a little different direction than what everybody else is in order to find some of those things. Right. Is there stuff to look out for? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that Pitfalls the first thing you want to do, fall into. here's the biggest pitfall. Make sure you do your homework so you know what you're getting. And if you buy from somebody who's reputable, they will tell you what's going on, you know, mm. with the instrument, if the pickups were replaced, if it's been refretted, if it's been refinished, that kind of thing. Because, you know, that has a lot to do with the value. So stuff that has been modified is worth less. And that's not to say that they're not great instruments. I have you know, certain guys who, you know, love the stuff that has some mods because then they can, it's more affordable to buy something that is the old sound, the old sure. feel, but, you know, maybe not 100% original and right. they get a bargain on it. Right, 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 right. 
uh, <clears throat> what's what's next out there for you that you want to do? Well, I'm 69 years old. Probably go home and sleep. That's probably <laughs> next, you know. So right. That's yeah. next on the list. That's yeah, next on the Get list. Get a little re- yeah. little rest out there. It's probably the old age home is what's next on the list. <laughs> no, but as long as I can, you seem like a, you see, you got a young heart, man. Well, I think because I'm around so many musicians, and I think music keeps you young at heart. Yeah, absolutely. So when I look in the mirror, that do you I get still scared. get right? Right, well, me too. Do you still get to play? Do you play a lot? You know, when I play here and there, and not not much anymore. I mean, you know, I honestly, you know, at the end of the day, I'm kind of beat, and yeah. you know, I have family and I have grandkids now and i'm you know i'm pretty attached to them and yeah you know i mean every once in a while like i'll hear something on the radio and i have a fairly good ear you know so you know i'll go home and i'll go to the piano or something and just kind of hammer it out and yeah. that kind of thing but yeah i think i'll leave that to the young guys desert island you get five guitars to take with you on your desert island what are they well do i have to take an amp too because that you can take an amp yeah okay, you, right. get, you get you so, get you get five guitars and three different amps well Blonde ES-335, I'm really into that. Nice. You know, a great old Strat, great 50s Les Paul. Everyone's going to know everyone's a gonna cool know arch which top. Strat. Oh, a cool arch top. Yeah, like an L5. Sure. You know, or a Super 4 or D'Angelico or Stromberg or something like right. that. But what's so, the Strat? And a great, uh, or a couple great flat tops, Martin, Gibson, and there's some other really nice boutique builders that we deal with too, like yep. uh, this guy Kevin Ryan, who's fantastic, or Don Musser. Yep. Those guys are really terrific, you know, aren't, you know, acoustic builders. Yeah. What? But what's the strat? Well, I mean, you know, I uh, the problem is, is that when you're into it, you kind of like. I like, like them all. maple necks from the 50s because they have a certain thing. I like the 60s guitars. Yep. I like custom color stuff. I mean, there's just so many things to like yeah. that, you know, that's that's the problem with collecting guitars. Right. But I call it functional art because it's not something that you just stare at like a stamp or a coin and, you know, you can't right. really do anything. Right. It makes music. So each one of them has its own voice. Yep. And uh, so, you know, each one has something that, you dig for what it is right and on any given day you know one may do it for me and then the next day something else might be my number one yeah do you do you are you a player um i wouldn't want to call myself <laughs> that. I, I play a little bit i mean okay. you know i'm a i'm a poor but you know decent guitar player and that i can play like stuff like curtis mayfield was like one of my favorites you know so i mean i like a lot of stuff that's understated where right. you know a lot of the guys now are playing so many notes i mean it's great that they can do it yeah. but it doesn't hit me in the heart right like you know some of the stuff like curtis mayfield or steve cropper or, sure. you know some of the you know bobby womack you know people right. like that and that's right. kind of more my thing you know yeah. so um, i'm more of an r&b kind of guy you know yeah. so um so, you know, I, I love that kind of stuff. But actually, my second instrument was bass. I mean, I played keyboards. Hammond organ was number one and then piano and yeah. some synth and stuff. But the last gigs I did were actually on bass. I was playing in a nine-piece R&B band. Wow. And I was playing keyboards. And the bass player got a better gig for more money one day. And we had, like, a contract to do... Um, you know, some shows that yeah. we were obligated to do. And I kind of said, look, you know, I'm not a great bass player and I'd never played bass in a band in my life, <laughs> but I know enough about music and I knew yeah. the chord changes and all the, sure. the arrangements and all that. So I said, you know what? I think I can pull it off. And I ended up playing bass in the band for two years. Wow. So it was, and it was actually, you know, one of the most fun things because, you know, what, you know, what you mainly do, you're so used to, but when you do something that's a little different, yep. it was really you know more interesting to me and a lot more fun and bass it's more you it's less thinking and more feeling right right no i had the same exact i was playing out here for a while and i'm a guitar player singer songwriter and i got asked to play bass for this other singer songwriter and i was like i don't know what the hell i'm doing but i had a bass in the house that i just used to you know for stuff that i was doing yeah i didn't really know how to play it but to play bass to go from a guitar where I have all these licks and all these things and whatever that I've been doing since I was 13 years old, you know, and I started to go to an instrument, to go to another instrument, first of all, where you don't know what's going on, and then you're in a whole other piece of the music, right? Well, you're you, playing you know, bass. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're back with the drummer. Right. You're listening well, to that. Well, the beauty of the bass is it's not what you play, it's what you don't play. Leaving space right, right. and holes is like really important. That's something that a lot of people, yeah. a lot of young kids don't get. But, you know, if you're when in doubt, leave a note out. 
you right. know, and that kind of thing, you <laughs> right. know. So, and get with the bass drums so that you guys are in sync, you know. Yeah. And that really <clears throat> is is kind of the main thing, you know, with bass. Plus, it's more of a feel thing. You know, yeah. I wasn't a soloist. I wasn't right. ever. And right. I grew up with Jocko. Jocko was in Miami. He was an old friend of sure. mine. And he was the greatest soloist, and I wouldn't even begin to try. Yeah. But, um, but I kind of knew as a keyboard player, you know, and from playing with other bass players, how to stay out of the way, which is really yeah. important because that leaves room for the other guys, the soloists, to play stuff. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Whenever I would always think of it, if I was playing keyboard and I'm playing bass, what would I want to not hear? Right. And, you know, it's a matter of elimination more yeah. than anything. Cool, man. Norm, I know you got a busy schedule and a whole world going on next door you got to go be a part of. So I want to oh, thank, thank you. you tremendously for doing this people find you on the website absolutely normsguitar.com uh norms rare guitars you can Perfect. go to youtube keep it up man all right Look likewise see you next time all right hopefully all thank right. you very much you got it oh yeah there it is mr norman harris thank you buddy and thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of the all guitar network i can't wait to get started folks stay tuned next week episode number 89 we got kevin doogie dugan in the house base tech for a long time for mr michael anthony and don't forget in the meantime you can follow us on twitter facebook instagram soundcloud itunes google play and youtube all as roadie free radio check out the website roadiefreeradio.com send us a note you know i want to hear from you that's info at roadiefreeradio.com and in the meantime y'all be safe out there Thank you.